All right, welcome to the 105th event of the Otara University of Commerce English Lecture Series. Today we have John Hayes. He is a Scuba City Council member. And the title of his talk today is My Life as a Politician, What You Think I Do, What I Really Do. Please welcome Mr. John Hayes. Thank you very much. So before I begin, uh, does anyone have a birthday today? No, this month? Does anyone have a birthday this month? Birthday, Tanjobi. Nobody has a birthday in November. It's a Hokkaido thing. Ha! Huh. Okay. I guess people get busy in January, maybe? December? December? Oh, okay, good for you. So you get to ask the first question later. So you have to think now about the next, about the questions. Okay? So, happy birthday. Sort of. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, as he said, uh, my name is John Hayes. It's uh, nice to be here today. Um, as you heard, I am a Scuba City Councillor. Uh, my, th I have been uh, elected three times now, unbelievably. And uh, I am the third foreign-born city councillor in all of Japan. So the first was a guy called Ma uh, Tsurune Mate. And he came from uh, Yamagata, I think, well, Finland, but uh, he got elected in Yamagata. And at one point, he was in the diet. You know the diet? So the girls all know about diet, yeah? Hello? Hello? Is this mic on? Yeah, okay. Anyway, san sangin ninata. Tsurinin mate. Zenzen wa ganedo? Okay. Uh, anyway, the second guy is uh, a New York-born guy called uh, Anthony Bianchi, and he is now the council chairman in a city called Inuyama near, I, uh, near Nagoya, Aichi Ken. Uh, he is a former jet teacher. Uh, okay. So then, and tap. Today I'm going to break up my speech into four topics. I will give you my personal history. Uh, in, an introduction to how elections work and then we will break a little bit and find out what you think I do and then I will tell you what I really do. Okay? Alright, so next. Sorry, we had a little bit of a problem. We had a bit of a problem today because uh, my iMac, or sorry, my iPad broke. Uh, now it doesn't show it. Where are those notes? This always happens, doesn't it? All right. Um, okay. It's not wanting to do it for some reason. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so, I imagine you're all wondering how I came to be here. Uh, first, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, I'm going to go back all the way to the 20th century. I know that's ancient history for most of you. Um, this is not working. Uh, so we're going to go all back, all the way back to um, very early 20s. Uh, I come from a long line of German Mennonite immigrants. So Mennonite is a kind of Protestant religion. So uh, Mennonites believe in baptism in adulthood. Do you know what baptism means? Baptism? Baptism. So, uh, when you say, oh, I believe in God, and then they pour water on your head. This is a Christian thing. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Doesn't matter. Uh, in any case, my grandparents came from Dnieper Petrovsk. As you can see, this is in the Ukraine, in the eastern part. So, right now, the Russians and the Ukrainians are fighting about this particular area. 
Uh, in, the 19, in 1917, there was a big revolution, the Russian Revolution, and when the communists came into power, they forbade religion. And since they were all very religious, they decided to move. So they spent a little bit of time in Germany, and then they moved to Canada, and particularly Winnipeg. So you can see Winnipeg is very, very close to Vancouver. Vancouver is about here, so about 2,500 kilometers east of Winnipeg, in a very small village called Grunthal. And this is me, um, this is where my parents grew up, and where my, uh, my brothers and sisters were born, and myself, this is me, age four, or four months. So we're getting the hang of this here. All right. Uh, in, the num in the summer of 1963, after I was born, my parents decided to move to a place called Meadow Lake, also a small community, where my father became a priest. Uh, he, uh, he moved around for the first 10 years or so. Uh, because he was very outspoken. That is to say, uh, he read the Bible and the Bible told him how people are supposed to act. And when he saw people not acting very Christian, then he said something about it and they got mad and fired him. So this is how we ended up in uh, Alberta, Didsbury, and then to Weimark. Uh, then we lived in Kansas for two years where my father became a proper teacher and then finally we moved back to Weimar. Um, this is where uh, this is where I grew up mostly. This is a very very small community about 150 people and this is the area around my home area. Uh, it is so flat Okay, we got it. Got to work this out here. Okay, it's so flat you can see your dog running away for three days. <laughs> it's so flat you can see who is coming to visit you tomorrow. And everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows exactly what you had for dinner last night. And I spent my 13 of my first 18 years there. This is me in uh, various grades. Uh, so this is my parents. I mentioned earlier my parents were very religious. So when God said, go out and multiply, they had a bunch of kids. So these are my naturally born brothers and sisters. And then the Lord also said that my parents should be very generous. They should be charitable to the needy. So they had five more adopted children. So I am number six of 11 kids. I was in Japan for two years before my parents even knew I left. <laughs> so, um, it says in the Bible you should not take the Lord's name in vain, which means you shouldn't say bad words. And my mother really took this to heart. So anytime I said a bad word, like damn or something like shit, my mother, she always took a bar of soap and she put it in my mouth because my mouth was dirty. So she washed my mouth out with soap. Yeah. All right. So uh, you might think that my parents were a little bit crazy. And maybe they are a little bit. But uh, in any case, I developed a long history of swearing a lot as soon as my parents could no longer control me. So if, I, if you hear a fuck or a goddammit, please don't be surprised. 
I never understood why God would create a whole glossary, a whole vocabulary, and then say, don't use it. Didn't make any sense to me at all. So one of my, uh, when my, when my father, we moved to Kansas, uh, so this is in the middle of the United States, and in any case, I'm sure that you would think my parents are a little bit crazy, uh, but I have to say my, my parents, especially my father, he was very a liberal person, so uh, even though they tried to make us all religious, in fact, most of us became atheists. Atheist, wakarimasu ka? Atheist. Mushukyo. No God. Okay. Uh, anyway, if I have to point to a major influence in my father, it was that he loved science fiction. So, Star Trek especially. You know Star Trek? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, my mother's values were very much about plain love and uh, forgiving and forgetting. So my parents always found a place for anyone at our table. And in fact, sometimes my, friend, my, my brothers or sisters, they would bring someone home unannounced for Christmas. And in fact, there was always a present under the tree for this guy, even if it was just a belt that my mother found someplace. All right. Uh, when I was in Kansas, I had a very memorable experience in that uh, we moved in 1969. So maybe your parents weren't even born yet at this point. Mm. We spent two years there uh, in, this, in the town of Burton. This is a town of about 1,000 people. Uh, my father studied to become a proper teacher, so teaching in high school or elementary school. Uh, my one memorable event for me was uh, after about three days or so, one of my classmates, he pulled me aside and he says, John, how many bombs does Canada have? And I said, hmm, I don't know. I was eight years old. Oh, the United States has more bombs, enough bombs to blow up the whole world four times. And I kind of thought, like, why would anyone want to blow up the world even once? But in any case, uh, this guy is my age, and we can imagine who he voted for recently. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was my first experience with living outside of the United, uh, living outside of Canada. Uh, so it was a good chance for me to compare my life with other people's lives from another country. Uh, after my dad returned, or after my family returned to Canada, he got a job in a school, and in the school the rules are a little bit different. If you work there for two years, then they can't fire you anymore. So this is called tenure. You have tenure? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. So, good. So he can't be fired anymore. Uh, so this made my life a lot more stable. Uh, and I guess I could say I had a little bit of a normal life, but not really. And in fact, when I was 17, I decided to go to Germany for a student exchange. So I was in a small city, about uh, 200,000 people, I think, in northern Germany, called Oldenburg, where I learned a little bit about German. And for me, this was the turning point in my life because I saw how other people lived. And so I really uh, had my eyes opened. And uh, it really changed me because when I came back to Canada, all of my classmates, they were still very focused on Canada. I started to think a lot about the rest of the world. So I wanted to have more. And in fact, I finished high school, but I couldn't go to university right away. So I decided to go back to Germany. I uh, went in 1983 to 
a farm in Germany. I milked, milked cows for about eight months. And from this time, I really could speak German. Every day, we would milk cows twice a day. And uh, the, the older guy there, Mr. Mut is his name, uh, we used to talk a lot during the milking time. And I enjoyed this quite a lot. So in any case, uh, when I was studying German in high school, uh, for me, German was not really a tool for communicating. It was more a barrier to getting good marks in school. So I didn't do so well, but I guess I did well enough. Uh, in any case, we move on. Uh, after Germany, I could have gone back to university, but I decided I was not ready yet and I didn't know what I wanted to do. In fact, in high school, I was pretty good at uh, math and science and other, other languages. So, in any case, I decided I'd take a detour and I went to Israel for seven months. And I worked on a kibbutz. A kibbutz is a commune. So everyone owns everything. Commune. How do you say commune? Do you know? Kyo, kyo san to, but kyo san mura kana? Kyo san cho? Hmm. So a very strange place. So you go home now, your parents, they own their house or they own their apartment. In this kibbutz, that was not true. Everybody owned everything and they shared everything. So this was a very interesting time for me. Uh, anyway, I think I have given you enough of my world tour. Uh, and I went back to university. In, uh, and graduated in 1991 and uh, it was uh, at this time I had to decide what I was going to do. I knew that I wanted to travel so I studied music education so I am a music teacher uh, but instead of just doing four years of school I did tours here there and extended my university career much longer than I should. And it reminds me of, uh, okay, this won't mean anything you'll understand. You know the stoner? He says, dude, grade 12, best four years of my life. Right? Okay, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Uh, in any case, uh, afterwards, I decided to come to Tokyo. Well, come to Japan. So I didn't move immediately. I had to do a little bit of work to save some money. Uh, in any case, uh, I arrived in 1991. I had about $1,000 in my pocket. And when I first came, I stayed in kind of a hotel. It was called at that time a gaijin house. So everybody lived in one room, paid just a little bit of money, uh, and uh, it was still very expensive. I think I shared my room with six other people and we paid 4,000 yen a night. So this was a good idea to get out of Tokyo. Tokyo is too damn expensive. And so I ended up in a place called Ushiku. Ushiku is uh, very close to Scuba. You know where Scuba is, I assume. Uh, and at the time, I was working for uh, the Ushku English Center, it was called, and uh, it only took about one month before I got fired. <laughs> My boss didn't like foreigners. I don't know why she owned an English school, but she didn't like foreigners. In any case, uh, actually, I got fired many times the first couple of years. In fact, I got fired twice by the same school. <laughs> And afterwards, I asked the owner to be my nakodo for my wedding. So it was okay in the end. When I arrived, there were 50 new English teachers arriving every day at Narita. 50 new teachers every day. So in any case, even though I got fired, I had made some friends and I was able to continue working in, uh, as, a, as a private teacher for a couple of, uh, couple of years. 
but English teaching is not such a great job. It gets kind of boring. So I knew that I could not be an English teacher. Uh, I could open up a school if I wanted to, but it was a bit risky and not something I really wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I decided to open up a bar. So my parents also thought, told me that alcohol was bad, so of course I opened up a bar. Uh, and I did this, this bar, this particular bar, I ran for about one year with a couple of partners. But uh, in business, partners are not really so easy to work with. So after one year, I decided to leave, and I opened up another bar. I got married. This is my wife, the lovely Noriko. And uh, we opened up another bar. And this one is, uh, this one was uh, much larger, twice as big, and more like a bar Ah, there we are. More like a bar that I was used to in... Oi! Oh yeah, okay, good. Uh, I need to get rid of that sign. Huh. Should run these presentations beforehand. Uh, in any case, I needed to open up... Uh, or I need, I, it was a bar more like what I was used to. We had uh, dancing, of course, and live music, and uh, foosball. You know foosball? Table soccer? Yes? Yes? Okay, foosball. Anyway, that's... Uh, and uh, music and such, so anyway. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it was an uh, unlucky time. So a few years after I opened up, there was a very serious accident. This uh, truck driver was drinking and driving. So someone saw him, that he had beer, and he was drinking, and he was going all over the road. They called the police, and the police did nothing. Half an hour later, he ran into the back of this car. He killed two children and injured the parents very seriously. So uh, the end result was that the government decided to act. And uh, very quickly, two years, which is quick by government terms, uh, they changed the law so that uh, if you were caught drunk driving, it was a million yen and lose your license for a year, and then it just got worse from there. So in the end, uh, I started to lose a lot of money. Uh, it was during this time I tried to get other bar owners in my area to organize. When I was younger, in the 80s, the same thing happened in Canada. That is to say, the police became very active. And so the bar owners also started to lose money, but they got together and they went to talk to the city council and they got help. And they got a program called Designated Driver. So Designated Driver means that uh, if three or four of you will go out tonight drinking, one of you will drive and they will drink cola or, or juice and the other people can drink as much as they like. So this is what designate, designated driver means. In Japan, you have daiko, so it's a little bit better, more expensive, but in any case, that's the system here in Japan. So, and eventually, though, it was uh, too much, and uh, we had to close. However, it was during this time that I decided that it was time for me to try and make a real, uh, a real change. Uh, and try to get some real influence in the local government. So I remember I was sitting in a bar and I was complaining and I said, if I had half a mind, I would run for single, uh, city council myself. And of course someone said, well, yeah, you should, or you are, half a mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I decided to run and uh, the rest is history, I guess. Um, there were a couple of considerations that I, that I made. Uh, number one, we have about 7,000 foreigners living in Scuba. Um, half of them are Chinese and Koreans. So uh, 
many of them I think are Zainichi, but still they are foreigners, considered foreigners, but still there are a total of 7,000 and uh, altogether at that time we had 33 city councillors and if you divide the number of city councillors by the population each city councillor represents about 7,000 people. So I thought, yeah, we need a foreigner to represent us. So at the time I was still Canadian, but I changed my citizenship so that I could also become a politician. And in nine, uh, 2012, I ran in my first election. So the system uh, is a little bit different here. In Canada, they would take a city, this is the map of Scuba, uh, they would take a city and they would divide it up into many different areas and then in each area they would have a small election and so you would have two people running and one of them would become the, the representative of just this area. He would become this area's daihyo. Okay? But that's not how things work in Japan. Everybody is in the same area. That is to say there is a long list of candidates and you have to choose one. So uh, it actually was much easier for me to get elected than if I had tried to run in Canada because uh, anyway, it doesn't matter why. That's just the way it is. Uh, so in our case there were 40 candidates. Candidate is um, uh, Koho. There were 40 candidates and the, the top 33 people got a job. So these are just examples of, of how it looks. And so from here, they don't get elected. So these are the results. I did pretty good as you can see. Uh, I came in second. I had 4,000 and 11 votes. So that was pretty good. Uh, so I understand now a little bit more about the system. Uh, generally the candidates, they will talk to their kucho, or they will talk to JA, they will talk to JC, G Junior Chamber of Commerce, or perhaps even the larger Chamber of Scom uh, Commerce, or also PTA, something like this. Uh, in any case, uh, these are how the candidates decide to run. If they have support like this, then they will run. Uh, but then there are something called the fudohyo. So I think you guys understand fudohyo. You know fudohyo? Undecided. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, this is in, in scuba at the time. So 90,000 people voted, but they estimate about 30% of the votes are fudohyo. And if you had 15,000 1,500, 1,500 votes, 1,600 votes, you could get elected. So 30,000 votes, I just need to find these 30,000 votes. So in any case, uh, this was, uh, this is my second and third election. These are the results. So in the second election and the third election, I came in number two. And you can see that I had a lot more votes than number 28. In fact, in my last election, I had more votes than the bottom three people. So 28, 27, 26, I had more votes than their total together. Uh, so, okay. Uh, you would think John may be just a little bit lucky, but not quite so, so quick. In fact, I had a few cards up my sleeve. Uh, so uh, a couple of years before I ran, I decided to get into TV and movies. So this is one of the movies that I was in. You know Nihon Chimbotsu? Yes? Yes? No? Yes? Never heard of it. Okay. It's a famous book and they made it into a movie. This is a parody called Nihon Igai Zenbu Chimbotsu and I played the American president. So there you are, I had my nice red, white, and blue flag, even though I was Canadian at the time, in any case. Uh, I was also quite lucky that I got into this TV program called Nodami Kantabere. 
and I was uh, Kai Dun. And it was a very, very popular show in uh, 2007, and I was very lucky that they decided to play the same, to replay the same TV show in 2008, just before the election. So that was very lucky. So I had also been working in the bar, and uh, of course I met many people in the bar. Uh, so whether these people voted for me, I don't know. Uh, but it really helped that I looked like Clinton as well. So I'm not sure why the people voted for me. I am just glad they did. So now we come to the portion where I ask you, what do you think I do? My job as a politician. What do you think I do? What is my job? What is the job of a politician in Japan? Politician. Seijika. Douyu shigoto. Nihon demu yo. Dozo dozo. Oh, nice guess. What do you think a politician does? Mm, very nice idea. Somebody in the back. You in the middle who's trying to avoid my look with the glasses. Yes, you. What do you think a politician does? Hi? Hmm. Well, okay. I'm going to tell you what I really do. It's much different than you think. So, uh, first off, I want to tell you that in the government, the politicians are not the most important people. You think we are at the top, but that is not true. I think you can ask uh, Dr. Clanky here who is more important, himself or his secretary. And he will say, oh, the secretary, of course. It is the people who do the work who are more important. So he gets all the applause and he gets the salary, but she is the one who does all the work. It's true. It's true. And it's the same in government. It is the komui who do all of the work. And they actually decide how people are going to live in the town and the city. The politician's job is not to decide. Uh, sorry, we decide, but mm, how do I put this? It is the komuing who do all of the work. So we can just say yes or no. So perhaps we can influence, we can ask the komuing, wouldn't it be nice to have a new skateboard park, for example? And they can say, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe, we'll see. Uh, in any case, uh, in the city council, yes, we do decide. However, many of the gian, the bills that come, they actually come from the national government. So in the near future, they will stop smoking in bars and restaurants. Okay, so this is a national plan. However, this law has to come to the city and the city can say yes or no. But of course, we will always say yes. So most of the time, we just say yes to whatever is decided by the Komuin. So my actual life, we have four sessions a year. Four, four times we get together. So each session uh, is a total of about six days. So on the opening day, the mayor, he will give a nice speech, 
and he will tell us these are the, the bills, the gion, that we will talk about in this session. Uh, this takes about one hour, and then we go home. So about a week later, we get together again, and we have the general questions. This is the Ipanch Tsumong. And it is this time where the city councillors can talk to the government, to the Shkobu, and ask them about projects. We can ask them about what they are doing. So I love to ride bicycle. And I like to have bicycle safety as a priority in our city. However, there are these bicycle paths. We call them uh, pedestrian decki, where the bicycles can ride, but most of the komuing don't ride bicycles. So they do not care about the condition of these bicycle paths. So I am always asking them, please repair this, this hole, please fix that about the pedestrian deck. So in any case, uh, each city councillor has a chance to talk for about 30 minutes and asking the government about his or, I, his or her ideas. So uh, general questions last for three days. So this starts at 10 o'clock and finishes around 5. Uh, after the general questions, then we have another holiday for about uh, four or five days and then we have the committee meetings. So the committee is Iinkai. Uh, so each of the Giang, each of the bills, are divided into four categories. So for example, we have the Somu. Uh, Somu is uh, general affairs. So this has to do with the salaries of the Komuing. This has to do with uh, the city, count, uh, city building or city buildings. Uh, this has to do with buying paper, for example, or new, uh, new printers, these kinds of things. Then there is uh, health and welfare. So this is your Kokumin uh, Hoken, your health insurance. This is about schools uh, and such things. Uh, then we have uh, one more committee for the economy. So this has to do with uh, how the rules of the city for the regular people, for businesses, how these are decided. And then finally we have the construction, which is uh, where I am right now. So the construction committee, we discuss roads. So if the city wants to build a new road or take out a road, uh, these kinds of changes, we will talk, uh, they will talk to us. Uh, if, for example, the, the city decides to build a new school, then the construction part will go to the construction committee, but the uh, education part will go to the health and welfare. So uh, health, uh, health and welfare and also schools. So this usually is about two hours or so. And then we are done. And then finally we have the voting, which is about uh, one week later. So the voting, first in the, the committee chairman, Yi uh, Ying Cho, he will give a report. We discuss this, this, this and we said yes or no to each of the bills. Okay, so first we get a report and then we actually do the voting. Many of the bills are not so controversial. Uh, no one is really arguing about them. So these bills, in fact, we do not even vote. They are just lumped together and say, okay, if no one objects, then these, these are all passed. Uh, if there is a bill which is uh, controversial, then someone will stand up and say, oh no, I don't think we should do this. Uh, it's almost always the Kyo Santo. They are nicknamed the uh, Nandemo Hantaito. Kyo Santo, ne? Okay. So that is the situation. Uh, okay. What happened here? So, after the Ipan Chitsumon is finished, then we will... Oh, yes. Uh, many people think that um, our job as a city councillor, we are a rubber stamp committee. 
And mostly this is true. Almost all of the bills that come to us, we will say yes. However, every now and again, something really crazy comes along and we will say no. And here is an example. This is the scuba sports complex. So this complex, the mayor decided he wanted to build a big stadium. So he wanted to have a 25,000 seat stadium. He wanted to have a 6,000 seat sports arena. So for basketball and handball and these kinds of sports. He wanted to have 20 tennis courts. And this was going to cost a lot of money. 660 oku n. So for those of you who still think in foreign currency, this is about 80,000 Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> $58 million. So uh, we decided that this was too expensive, but mostly because of the location. So the nearest public transportation was the train, and it was 10 kilometers away. So my thinking, the only way to get to the stadium would be by bus. And if we would have a full stadium, 25,000 people, this means we would need about 125, 150 buses to go from the station to the sports arena. So this means that if one bus came every minute, it would take more than two hours just by the buses. So there was just no possible way this was a good idea. This was my own feeling. So personally, if he had tried to build a stadium close to a station, meh, maybe it, it would have been a chance. In any case, uh, this was one example where we said no. So uh, I have told you a little bit about our public life. Uh, there are other public events that we often go to see. Uh, the Seijinshiki, Sotsugyoshiki, uh, these kinds of events, we go to these as well. And mostly we go, we show up, they will introduce us and we say, congratulations, omerito. I always do bilingual, the kids love that. Oh, they are learning English in school, so oh, there's some English for them. So these events, so probably in one year we are doing 10, 10 of these events. So uh, these are some of the examples. Uh, then we do other things which are related to our job. So we will go on uh, shisatsu. So we will go on a study tour and we will go, for example, we might come to Otaru a group of us might come here because the city of Otaru is doing some special, special thing with solar power or tourism, some kind of excuse. Um, we also have uh, official visits. So this is, uh, we went to China. We have a sister city. Sister city is uh, Shimai Toshi. Uh, we have a sister city in China uh, called uh, Shenzhen, uh, Shisen in Japanese. This is very close to Hong Kong. And then finally we have a kind of private events really, the, the sports. So baseball, bowling, golf, this is our own money, the government doesn't pay, but we will get together with other city councils. So we will have a nice event, afterwards we have some eating and drinking, we can learn we can meet other city councillors and we can talk about various issues. So recently the big talk is about Korea, of course. And I think here maybe you guys are also concerned about Korea, I'm sure. And maybe Russia too, hey? Yeah. Uh, and then we do other things. We are often invited, if we are elected, we are often invited to go to other people's elections. So uh, this guy here, he is the Ibaraki Ken counselor. And uh, over here, this is the, for the diet for, um, uh, uh, shugiing. 
Shuging, this is the, and you can see Mr. Abe is there. Prime Minister Abe is there. And then finally, this is for the governor. And this is my son, by the way. He's still single, by the way. Still single. And anyway, uh, the purpose of these, um, the reason we go to these events is that the, the candidate, the person who is trying to run, he hopes that by me showing up, it will show his supporters how popular he is. Because I had so many votes, oh yes, see? If you, you should vote for me because, oh, we have all these popular people behind me. Of course, this doesn't work so well. Uh, this guy, he was the Ibaraki uh, Chiji, and he was the Chiji for six times. So 24 years, he was the governor. And in this election, he lost, even though I was there. Ha! Huh, go figure. <laughs> so uh, we... It uh, seems to me that I have a very interesting life, and I think I do. Uh, we go all over. We go all over Japan, get to meet all kinds of people. Uh, but uh, the reality is, I have to attend a lot of meetings, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Clanky here will tell you how much he loves going to meetings. Yes. The thrill of my life. There, yeah. Bet you wish you could send your secretary. Right? <laughs> Uh, so in any case, um, as I mentioned before, I was uh, very interested in... Oh yeah, the drinking part, that's the best part. I was interested in the bicycle paths, and I wanted the city to uh, make a dividing between the pedestrian and the cyclist. So people cycle a lot because it's very flat in scuba. So it's, just, it's nice to have the bicycle. However, if people are walking where the bicycles are, then it causes a problem. So I said, please show bicycle and walking. So the city, very kindly, they painted one side blue, one side red. Red for the bicycles, blue for the, uh, the, the pedestrian. Uh, and then also they should put up a sign of which was which. So we kind of got mixed results. Uh, my thinking is we have so many foreigners in scuba and uh, most of them will not buy a car, they will, they will ride a bicycle. So um, it's important they be able to understand where they are supposed to go. Oh, I guess blue is bicycle, not red. Uh, however, you can see, you know, for people who cannot read kanji, w what does this mean? You know, so I had very mixed results. So I'm not sure if I should laugh or I cry about these <laughs> results. Uh, in any case, uh, here is another example. This is the signage. So for the foreigners, okay, I guess you say no smoking and no, no litter, but uh, my friends, some of them got caught smoking and like, ah, 2,000 yen, why? Oh, there's the sign. It's like, huh? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, in any case, uh, a few years ago, our city built a new city office and they very kindly put some hiragana, uh, well, furigana, and even English, except for one location. Where is the English? <laughs> So you can see how successful I have been getting the city to do what I want. Yeah, all right. Okay, come on. In any case, my feeling is that if you have at least Romaji, then most foreigners will be able to understand, even if they come from China, even if they come from Mongolia, because in English dictionary, you can look it up by the letter. It's very hard to look up kanji if you don't have a software these days. Now I guess you can do the picture, but uh, in any case. So, anyway, I just try to, I, I try to make the city make things as simple as possible. 
My thinking is that if it is easy enough for a child, a six-year-old who does not read or write Japanese yet, if it's that simple, then the foreigners or anyone else who comes will also be able to participate. So, uh, we'll wrap things up. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Clanky for inviting me here today. That was very kind of him. And it's, come on, down. Uh, so from here, I guess we can ask questions. Do any of you have any questions? Nihongo demo i. My Japanese is namara hetakso, but in any case, I learned that yesterday. Namara. Okay, let's open up for questions. But first, let's thank uh, John Hayes for his presentation today. Questions?